this edition of All Hands Television, we look at the history of underway replenishment. We join sailors embarked aboard USNS John Lenthal, and we look into the future of wheeled vehicles. And now, your host, Petty Officer Kat Smith. In the days of sail, a ship could travel as far as its stores of hardtack and potable water allowed. Its fuel was the wind. After our Civil War, with the advent of steam-powered vessels, the range of a ship was defined by its ability to hold tons of coal in its holds. The ability to supply a navy across distant oceans became a problem for our naval leaders during the Spanish-American War and the voyage of the Great White Fleet a hundred years ago. For those of us used to seeing oilers pull up alongside aircraft carriers to deliver millions of pounds of jet fuel, or to having helos drop pallets of food on the deck, resupply is a natural event. Sergeant Phil Grondon sat down with naval historian and author Thomas Wildenberg to get an understanding of how underway replenishment came about. The um, history of refueling at sea goes back to the Spanish-American War, where the fleet um, off of Cuba had to be refueled, and it was done by colliers um, in a protected harbor. So it really predates even the Great White Fleet. And of course, the whole emphasis of, of refueling at sea is, is to avoid the necessity of uh, steaming back to base to refuel. In 1907, the Great White Fleet left Norfolk and sailed around the world. In order to get fleet around the world, the Navy actually had to leave a whole um, flotilla of colliers to uh, precede the fleet and be in harbor so that the fleet could be refueled. The big lesson that was learned was uh, the need for logistic support. It's not generally known that all of these colliers that supported the fleet, most of them were leased from Great Britain because the Navy had one or two of its own colliers, not enough colliers, not enough fuel ships to support the fleet. When the U.S. entered World War I, the Navy decided to send several squadrons of destroyers to England to help in the fight against the German submarine fleet. But there was a big problem in that only one squadron of the destroyers that the Navy had in its fleet uh, could actually steam across the Atlantic. All the other destroyers did not have enough range. Fortunately, through the efforts of several naval officers, one of whom was Chester Nimitz, the crew of the Maumee, which was the second oiler that the Navy acquired, on its own initiative had developed a method of transferring fuel by hose from one ship to another. So that when war came, very fortuitously, the Maumee had this capability and she was posi positioned in mid-Atlantic to um, help these destroyers move from the United States to England. And this was the first operational use of refueling at sea. After World War I, the Navy continued to perfect the technique, primarily of better methods of refueling destroyers at sea. During the Great Depression, Congress appropriated funds to subsidize the building of 12 tankers. At the end of the 1930s, a Pacific War was clearly on the horizon. When war came, we were very fortunate that these 12 tankers were available and were immediately converted for Navy use. So that when Pearl Harbor um, occurred in December 7th, the United States already had perfected the means of refueling its aircraft carriers. And it was already converting these 12 tankers into fleet oilers. So that in the first six months of the war, um, the Navy was able to supply modern tankers to escort these carriers as they roamed the Pacific striking back at the Japanese fleet. There are many strategic advantages to underway replenishment. You could extend the range of ships. They no longer had to go back to base to refuel. Tactically, you could keep the ships on the move so that they were less likely to attack from submarine or later by aerial attack. And then thirdly, they could continue to, to steam towards their destination without losing time. At the end of World War II, as one of the reparations, the United States Navy acquired a German ship by the name of the Dittmartsen. And the Dittmartsen was one of the first what's called underway replenishment ships. Um, she was designed and built by the German Navy to replenish their ships at sea. And she had the capability of 
supplying all of the needs of a ship at sea, oil, ammunition, and supplies. And she was taken into the U.S. Navy and renamed the Conoco. And she was used as the first ship in the U.S. Navy to perfect, perfect the simultaneous transfer of fuel and ammunition. And this was an evolutionary process um, that, that really started, had its beginnings um, in World War I. It's one of the great logistic achievements of the United States Navy, something that set it apart from all other navies in the world, that its, its constant um, development and refinement of first coaling at sea, then refueling at sea, until now we have underway replenishment at sea. Keeping ships forward deployed and ready to carry out assigned missions requires us to remain able to not only fuel and supply ships at sea, but to do it better than anyone else. Since its founding in 1970, that role has been the domain of the Military Sea Lift Command. After the break, All Hands Television will be back with a unique look at an MSC deployment. To most of us, there's an obvious difference between this and this. Unfortunately, some feel it's okay to pick up the pace if you're late for work, or trying to catch a movie, or late for a meeting with your new commanding officer. The reality is, there's no good excuse for speeding. There's a time and a place for speed. City streets aren't it. Imagine doing this without a helmet. Did you realize that the impact sustained in an accident at 40 miles an hour is 20 times more devastating? Imagine doing that without a helmet. It's estimated an additional 640 motorcyclists would survive crashes each year if bikers would simply wear their helmets. Think about that the next time you ride. Military Sea Lift Command, or MSC ships, are equipped to replenish combatants underway with fuel, ammunition, provisions, and spare parts. As a result of the skill of the MSC crews and the sailors on board, our Navy can remain mission ready to carry out U.S. policy anywhere in the world. Primarily manned by civilian mariners, the MSC ships also have a small embarked Navy detachment. Here is the story of one MSC deployment, 11 days and millions of gallons of fuel. It's quite possibly the most dangerous job on the sea. Moving currents, big waves, two ships side by side with about 120 feet between them. Move around. Did I mention there's some flammable fuel being sent from one to the other? The art of underway replenishment has been a staple in keeping U.S. Navy ships at sea. It was an art developed by Admiral Chester Nimitz. It took some practice, but once learned, the U.S. Navy got good at it, and there was some jealousy on the high seas from old rivals as a result. The Russians never did master the art of underway replenishment, to much to their disadvantage. They used to try to disrupt us when we were, uh, um, while we were unwrapping. They would come and cut across our bow doing something they called, uh, we called chicken of the sea. And you thought today's unwraps are dangerous. All unreps are now conducted by the Navy's Military Sea Lift Command, which operates more than 110 non-combatant civilian crewed ships around the world. In addition to unreps, MSC ships also conduct specialized missions, reposition combat cargo at sea, and move military equipment and supplies used by deployed U.S. forces. USNS John Linthal is one of 14 fleet replenishment oilers. These Navy ships are unique in that they are crewed by civilian service mariners. Expert in underway replenishment with uh, 20, 30 years experience not being uncommon. And uh, when we're not under, uh, unwrapping, we are maintaining the ship and, and uh, doing the other functions of the vessel. The John Linthal has to be able to service many types of ships. In a period of three hours, a dance among ships takes place. 
Today, Lenthal refuels three cruisers, a destroyer, a frigate, and a fellow MSC vessel, rescue and salvage ship USNS Grasp. Refueling at sea isn't just exclusive to American ships. MSC ships have the ability to refuel allies such as this French ship. There is concern whenever an unrep takes place. Ships must have plenty of open sea for the operation. Each ship must be traveling at the same speed, maintain the same course, and the ships must be able to talk to each other. So with every ship, U.S. and foreign, communication is employed using radio, hand signals, and paddles. It's not just civil service mariners found on MSC fleet replenishment oilers. A small group of Navy sailors work on them. Aboard John Linthal, there's four operation specialists that work in tandem with the civilians. These sailors are vital to coordinating the unrep. The uh, OSs are the ones who are responsible for making the rendezvous arrangements with the Navy vessels. We have an excellent relationship. Uh, we work very closely together and uh, we eat together and live together and uh, they're just part of the crew. The ship's mariners and sailors handle the wide range of ships that need to be refueled and supplied. Some just need fuel oil for the ships. The fleet replenishment oilers such as John Lenthal can carry 180,000 barrels of fuel oil, including 54,000 barrels of jet fuel. During this 11 day underway, USNS John Lenthal pumped more than 3 million gallons of fuel to 17 ships. That's just a small amount of fuel carried by these fleet replenishment oilers. They carry much more fuel and can stay at sea for months, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. What isn't mentioned is the stores being sent between ships and the ammunition that's transferred via helicopter. It's a big job that has to be done. We go wherever the Navy goes. Wherever the uh, Navy is deployed throughout the world, you'll find MSC ships of various types supporting uh, Navy ships with, with uh, their, their logistic requirements. And we do it day in and day out and become very proficient at it. The Navy couldn't do what it needs to do without MSC. The service they bring is immeasurable. This group of civil service mariners doesn't have shore billets. When they work, their office is the sea. Their client is the sailor, and the mission is clear. Aboard USNS John Linthal, Petty Officer Chris Robinson, All Hands Television. On every ocean of the world, MSC ships are there to keep the fleet supplied. Next, we move from the open ocean to the high desert of Nevada, where testing is going on for what may be the replacement for the Humvee. We will have that story after this look at the June All Hands Magazine. The June issue of All Hands Magazine will give you an in-depth look at USNS John Lenthal as it travels the world refueling the fleet. We'll also show you how USS Boxer trains its sailors to become the front line of shipboard security. Then we'll go to Washington, D.C. and take you behind the scenes to show you what it takes to become a Navy Ceremonial Guardsman. Online or at your fingertips, it's the June issue of All Hands Magazine. My last Liberty call in Fort Lauderdale started off nice enough. But when I suddenly realized I was being tugged out to sea by a rip current, things got pretty scary. At first, I was too embarrassed to call for help. I'm a sailor after all. I should know what to do in a water emergency. But I was tiring quickly trying to swim against the current. I knew if I didn't get help, I'd drown. Thank goodness there was a lifeguard nearby. It only took him a few seconds to get to me, but it seemed an eternity. He towed me parallel to the shore until we were both free of the current. Then he easily pulled me back to the beach. I learned an important lesson about the sea that day. The trick to escaping a rip current is to swim parallel to the shore, not towards the shore, and look for rip current warnings when you first arrive. I'll never forget that day, but it hasn't dampened my love for the beach. Now I know what to do if it ever happens again. The Jeep was the icon of 20th century military vehicles. Introduced into service during World War II, its reign lasted until 1985 when the high mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicle or Humvee replaced it. Some 22 years later, the Humvee is nearing the end of its intended life cycle.
The Office of Naval Research and the Marine Corps are looking at new technology that could help to develop a new wheeled military vehicle. As was the case with the Jeep and the Humvee, vehicle requirements for worldwide deployment are once again changing. Sergeant Phil Grondon traveled to the Nevada Automotive Test Center in Carson City, Nevada, where he got a close-up look at a technology demonstrator vehicle that could point the way to an eventual replacement for the Humvee. This is a standard up-armored, high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, commonly known as a Humvee. It's similar to those used in Iraq and Afghanistan. In the not-so-distant future, this Humvee could turn into something that looks like this. More than 320 horsepower, 24 inches of wheel travel, adjustable ride height suspension. This is the Combat Tactical Vehicle, or CTV. Although not slated for production, this technology demonstrator model may be the answer to the Marine Corps' wheeled vehicle needs. The uh, Marine Corps' efforts for CTV started in 2005 and uh, was the uh, preliminary efforts to come up with a replacement for the Humvee uh, and evolved into what is now the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle Program, being it's a joint program with the Army and the Army's elite service. The uh, CTV Tech Demonstrator was the, is the product of what ONR had originally invested in uh, about a year and a half ago. In uh, 2005, the Marine Corps made a decision that they were going to try to replace Humvees with a more, uh, a more survivable platform yet still be agile. So ONR saw that as an opportunity to get some quick technology, uh, technologies that had high levels of uh, readiness already within them. The CTV is the only member of the JLTV family to ever be built by the government. As the war on terror continues, there's a need for combat vehicles to include armor as part of its basic structure. The Humvee was not originally designed as an armored vehicle. As combat conditions around the world changed, add-on armor modifications were later made available. The utilization of the Humvee in its current environment in, in the theater of operations requires it to be a armored vehicle. Uh, and when we actually put the armor on the vehicle to meet the protection requirements, uh, it, it can no longer carry the payload and then also the performance is affected because it was not originally designed to carry that much weight and still perform uh, to the standards that are expected. It was recognized that the threats changed a lot and the old days of being able to just run up and down the highway or run some cross country with a Humvee are gone. The Marine Corps was responsible for leading the efforts in writing new requirements for a replacement vehicle. Building a technology demonstrator became the responsibility of the Nevada Automotive Test Center under contract to the Office of Naval Research. We took those new requirements and went out to industry around the world. First of all, we went out and looked to see if there were any vehicles that already existed that could meet those requirements. And what we found was the answer was no. A lot of it was uh, specifications driven, trying to get a vehicle that could really help out the, the existing fleet. Uh, we didn't want to put a band-aid on uh, certain existing vehicles. We went out to industry literally around the world and developed a selection process to pick the best of the best for each of the components that would integrate into this system. Since its construction, the CTV has undergone vigorous testing on different types of terrain. This is Susan's Bluff, one of the many vehicle evaluation courses at NATC in Carson City, Nevada. Well, one of our terrains we have for the durability on a vehicle like this is cross country and hilly cross country. As you can see, this is hilly cross country. And what we're doing here is we're really working on the mobility of the vehicle. You can see how it's rocking over a lot of the terrain and the vehicle will slide over a lot of the loose surface on top and that causes shock waves to go back through the drivetrain and you'll get a reverse torque loading going downhill as, as opposed to when you're going uphill. I think the, the thing to take into consideration is that when they designed the vehicle those requirements were generated out of lessons learned and, and as the uh, scenarios changed both in Iraq and in Afghanistan, a lot of those lessons learned were incorporated in the requirements document which fed into the basic design of that vehicle. 
Soft soil mobility testing is conducted on sand dunes near Fallon Naval Air Station in Nevada. Both the Humvee and the CTV perform side by side. Going over soft sand, you want a big fat tire, kind of like a snow, snowshoe. That gives you better traction, really helps with the mobility of the vehicle. There's no free rides in the deep sand. On this day, the Humvee couldn't make it up the hill. It was given a free ride. So in terms of a head-to-head -head comparison, if we've got something going on at point A in the CTV, I can get more guys there faster and in better shape when we show up. And then if things really get bad, I can get out faster with more guys and, and the survivability rate will be that much more. Survivability has become one of the main issues facing any new vehicle design. We, again, looked at various solutions and we settled on a configuration utilizing ballistic aluminum. In developing this technology platform, we studied the blast pressure wave and the fragmentation that occurs from IED and mine blast and other events. During a vehicle rollover, the force exerted on the vehicle's roof is dissipated throughout the hull. This provides protection to the occupants. The use of a V-shaped hull provides an equal level of protection during an IED event. It means that the impulse from that event to the crew is substantially reduced, unlike, say, a historic vehicle that might have a flat bottom. As the science advisor deployed to Iraq, Hodges saw firsthand the effects of a vehicle rollover. We were, uh, we were running south of, south of Baghdad uh, in one op and uh, um, basically had been, had been out for a couple hours and, and uh, part of the convoy uh, got hit. And um, one of the Humvees that um, was in front of the vehicle I was in executed uh, uh, an avoidance maneuver. Uh, literally went down off the road because as everybody knows those you got these great paved surfaces and then you got these shoulders that literally just fall off the fall off on the edge so um, the operator uh, executed a maneuver to avoid the event directly in front of him uh, went down off the edge and attempted to come back on the on the hard stand uh, hit an obstacle that had been placed there and the vehicle uh, was was severely damaged as a as a result of a, a bad rollover. An ATC recreated a 45 mile per hour vehicle rollover incident. We brought that information back and incorporated enough structure in the uh, technology demonstrator here so that should a similar rollover occur, uh, that damage, that crush of the roof, that doors flying off, um, won't occur. The CTV includes a state-of-the-art control system. Everything operates at a push of a button. We went for the push button approach and what that accomplishes is now I see a dirt road, I push the dirt road button, it sets my transmission, it sets my tire pressures, it sets my ride height, and I don't have to think about anything. Um, and the same for sand, for water fording. It takes care of everything for the driver. Back of the driving range, the CTV goes through some more tests. This is our P3 course, one of our durability courses. And it's made, its main characteristic is the real high amplitude, for lack of a better term, whoop de doo And what we do, as you go over this course, it really, really puts the vehicle in a pitching motion and works the suspension. You go into full rebound, full jounce. And along with that, if a vehicle is limited in terms of its mobility and part of its suspension travel, you'll run into speed limited issues. So what we're seeing here, like right now, for example, we're doing just about 21, 22 miles an hour. 
A fully loaded Humvee over this course is only capable of about 8 to 10 miles an hour. So this configuration represents a platform that, if necessary, could be built tomorrow. The overall objective of that technology demonstrator was to demonstrate the art of the possible. For a light vehicle that can call, haul Marines around, be more survivable, and still be as agile as the, uh, as the current Humvee. Optimally, I'd like to deliver a, a vehicle with uh, significant Im uh, improved capability over what the Humvee is able to provide in its current state, um, and sooner than later. I know that we're looking at a uh, uh, low rate initial production decision about 2013 time period, uh, time period uh, actually achieving initial operational capability, which is actually filling the vehicle as an operational system around uh, 2015 time period. This vehicle, or, or based on this technology platform, this is the next new vehicle for the next 25 years, and it's very important to get it right. For the Naval Media Center, I'm Sergeant Phil Grondon. That's it for this edition of the program. Next month, we will be bringing you face to face with a sailor who fought a shipboard fire aboard USS Forrestal, July 29, 1968. Those firefighting efforts led to changes in how the Navy teaches sailors to fight fires. We sent a team to the Ferrier Firefighting School in Norfolk, Virginia. Here's a preview. Crash it, flame it, smoke it. Yeah, we did learn a lot from the USS Forrestal. Right there. We've learned a lot from that to affect what we're doing today. 1969, USS Enterprise went up. Well, they lost less people and the damages were less than the Forrestal from the lessons learned from there. All the techniques are pretty much basic techniques, basic firefighting techniques on how to put it out and how to maneuver. As summer nears, it's important to remember that accidents can happen. Whether you are riding that sports cycle, going to the beach or pool, or having a backyard barbecue, keep safety in mind. For more information about staying safe during the critical days of summer, check out the Safety Center website at safetycenter.navy.mil. For the All Hands Television team, I'm Petty Officer Kat Smith.